Welcome back everybody to the Deep Learning Jumpstart with PyTorch. In this tutorial, you are gonna learn how to code a simple convolutional neural network in PyTorch. We're gonna use it to do optical character recognition with the MNIST data set. You don't need to know anything about deep learning or convolutional neural networks. We're gonna cover everything you need to know as you go along. Let's get started. So as usual, we start with our imports and Torch has a whole bunch of them. So we'll need the base package Torch. We'll need the uh, NN package. We'll need NN.functional. Uh, these will serve as the basis for our layers and our activation functions respectively. We also need uh, the optimizer. Uh, the optimizer is, in this case, a form of stochastic gradient descent. We're going to use the atom optimizer as opposed to something like SGD, vanilla stochastic gradient descent, or the like RMS prop. So this is going to work to uh, change the weights of the neural network over time to increase the accuracy of their predictive power. We also need the uh, data sets. So we need from Torch Vision data sets import MNIST. Torch Vision has a whole bunch of data sets built in. We're going to use MNIST because it's going to run quickly. It's very simple. There aren't too many you know, hiccups in it. So it's a good data set to get started with. It's kind of a canonical problem in deep learning. It's not the most exciting. There are other data sets like the Coco data set that has a whole bunch of classes, but this will do for now. We need um, Torch Vision transforms. We will need the uh, two tensor. What this will do is it'll turn the raw data from the MNIST data set into PyTorch tensors. We also need NumPy to handle NumPy type operations. And we're going to do some plotting at the end. So we need matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. So in the previous video, we did a simple deep neural network to do this same classification task. We achieved an accuracy of something like 90%, I believe, maybe even up to 95%. Uh, so nothing to write home about, but pretty good for a very simple approach. And in that particular case, we used a uh, procedural uh, implementation where we didn't store anything in a class. In this case, we're going to take it one step further in both the complexity of the neural network we want to use as well as the uh, complexity of the computer science we're going to implement. So we're going to use a CNN class. And in PyTorch, they have the idiom where all of the uh, classes that extend the functionality of PyTorch must derive from this nn.module. And the reason is it gives you access to things like the parameters of the layers that you can use for the optimizer. Very, very important. Of course, when you do that, you have to define an initializer as usual. It'll take a learning rate, epochs, uh, batch size, and num classes. So for this data set, it defaults to 10. So we'll just go ahead and hard code that. Uh, but the other thing you have to do when you use inheritance in Python is call the super keyword, uh, super CNN self dot init. So next we move on to saving our member variables, all very standard stuff. We also need a, a couple arrays for keeping track of things like the loss history. That'll be helpful when we plot our data and we need an accuracy history because we want to watch the evolution of the accuracy over time. We want to see if this does better than our simple linear classifier. And spoiler alert, of course it does. Um, other stuff we'll need is a device. So the question came up in the previous video uh, how would you speed up the calculation by sending everything to the GPU? I'll make a separate video to address that, you know, kind of looping back to the first video to show specifically. But in this case, we're going to use uh, the torch.device function to say CUDA zero if t.cuda is available, else CPU. So what this will do is it will see that your uh, GPU is available. And if it is, it's going to use it for the calculations provided that you send the variables and the network to the GPU. This doesn't do that automatically. I'll show you how in a second. This just sets up the device for use later on by your neural network. And if you don't have a GPU, it'll default to the CPU. Uh, other th cool thing you can do is if you have multiple GPUs, you can say CUDA 0 or CUDA 1 or whatever number of uh, GPUs you have. So you can actually allocate different neural networks to different GPUs. If you want to run multiple models, you could say use something like a command line parameter to pass that in. 
So now we have to define our label, our layers, of which there are many. So the first is a two-dimensional convolutional neural network that takes one uh, layer, sorry, one channel as input. And we have one channel because the input images are grayscale. There's no RGBs, in which case, in which case there would be three filters, but you know, it's just grayscale, so it's just simply one. We're gonna apply 32 convolutional filters with a three by three size. Next, we wanna do um, batch normalization, batch norm 2D. That'll take 32 filters as input. That comes from the output of the other layer. Uh, next up, we want uh, to do a second convolution, and that is, again, conf2D. That gets 32, 32, and 3. 32 filters as input, 32 as output, and a 3x3 three three, uh, window. Then we need another batch norm layer. And if you don't know what batch normalization does, it simply... Uh, kind of does what the name implies. It takes a batch of data and normalizes it so that you get, you know, stuff between some boundary. You know, I, I, I honestly don't remember if it's minus one and positive one or zero and one, but either way, it takes uh, inputs that would otherwise be kind of all over the place, you know, of order 10, of order 100 or whatever, and normalizes them to something more manageable for the neural network. It helps facilitate uh, smooth training. We need another convolutional neural another convolutional layer and conv3 will take 32 by 32 by 3 again and we need a bn3 for another batch norm 2d um, and that of course takes 32 as input and then we're going to perform a max pooling what this does is uh, when you perform the convolutions what you're doing is you are taking a matrix which is of size three by three, that's where the three comes into to play. And you're sliding it over the input image. In this case, for the MNIST data set, the input image is a 28 by 28 image of pixels of handwritten digits. So you're sliding a three by three matrix over that 28 by 28 matrix, and you're performing matrix multiplication with each time you slide it. The product of those uh, matrix multiplications goes into the result, and that is going to be uh, not just one matrix, but in this case, a set of 32. So you can perform another operation on that, which is called max pooling. So you have a bunch of different values in that particular, um, on those filters, and you can do max pooling, which is a type of, um, another type of feature selection where you take the max of a two by two matrix. So you slide a two by two matrix over your 32 filters, each each of those filters, and you take a max element out of that two by two matrix. It's a way of reducing the dimensionality of the of the feature set. So I guess it's actually feature reduction, not really feature engineering. So uh, it's a handy function to use to take to decrease the dimensionality of your problem to something more manageable. But I digress. So next we follow that up with another convolutional <laughs> 2D layer, conv 2D. And that will have size 32 by 64 by three. So that will take 32 filters as input and output 64 filters, again, of size three by three. Again, with the batch normalization, 2D, but this time it takes 64 instead of 32. And then we'll have a fifth convolutional layer. And that is uh, of size 64 by 64, because it has 64 inputs, 64 outputs, three by three and another BN layer, again with a size 64. And then finally, self.com six equals nn.com 2D, and that takes 64 by 64 by three, BN six dot uh, batch norm 2D 64, and followed by max pool two. Good grief. Uh, okay, so this is the convolutional portion of our deep neural network. So what this does is it serves as a form of feature selection and, and uh, reduction from the input images into something that we can feed into a fully connected layer. But we have one catch in this, so I don't know the dimensionality that comes out of this, right? Because we have 64 filters, we've done a couple max pooling operations which will reduce the size of the feature set by a factor of two each time, so a total factor of four. So, you know, I haven't done the math and I'm not about to bust out pen and paper because I'm lazy and we can do it in a more elegant fashion that facilitates 
uh, more feature uh, hyperparameter tuning down the line. Say you want to change these numbers, you don't want to hard code the input dims because then you have to go back and redo the calculation every single time. So let's do it in an automated fashion. So we will define a function to handle that and we'll get to that in a second. But first we need to say self.fc1 is a linear layer, <laughs> linear, linear, and that will take input dims as input and it'll output number of classes. So it'll take whatever our convolutional neural network outputs, pass it through a simple linear layer, and then uh, calculate the probability of the image belonging to one of the 10 classes. Next we need an optimizer, and this is how the network is actually gonna learn. And that is going to be Adam. And what is it going to optimize? Self.parameters. Excuse me, you may notice we've never defined self.parameters, and that's where this inheritance from nn.module comes from. So it's kind of a uh, backdoor into the parameters of these layers in our deep neural network. So very important. And of course, you want to specify a learning rate because you know you kind of need one of those. Next, we need a loss function. And in the case of multi-class classification, you almost always want to use cross entropy loss. If you have only two classes, you can get away with binary cross entropy loss. Uh, but in this case, we have more than two, so it's going to be nn.crossentropyloss. Finally, we want to send the whole thing, the entire network, to the device. This is how you get the deep neural network on your device. I mentioned that earlier, and uh, that is very important for taking advantage of your GPU. And finally, we want to use a function to uh, get the data from the MNIST data set. So we'll define that in a moment, but we have to call it in the initializer. So next, we're going to uh, call a couple functions, and there's going to be some repetition here. Uh, this isn't good practice. I'm kind of repeating myself, but this is just for illustration purposes. If you wanted to improve on this code, then you would consolidate a lot of this material into a single function and then just reference that function, but I digress. So we want to calculate the number of input dimensions. So as I said, this is kind of tedious to do if you have a, um, if you try to do it by, you know, pen and paper. So it's best to just let the computer do the heavy lifting. So we'll say batch data equals t dot zeros, torch dot zeros, a batch size of one. This is very important. It's so that we can, we don't have to take into account or hardwire the batch size in. Just send in a batch size of one with one channel and 28 by 28. And I've forgotten a parenthesis here because this has to be a tuple. Uh, so this is a just an array of zeros in the shape one by one by 28 by 28. It's a four dimensional tensor. It doesn't matter that zeros because we don't care what comes out. All we care about is the dimensionality of what comes out. So who, who cares if the data is garbage? So then we say batch data equals self dot conv one batch data. And of course it's not batch minus data, it's batch underscore data. And what we're going to do here, the idea is we're just going to feed that array of uh, the four tensor of zeros all the way through the network and then see the size of the stuff that comes out of the other end and then plug that into our linear layer. It's the easiest way that I know of to, to actually, you know, make the computer do the hard work. So then we say uh, batch data equals self, <clears throat> batch data equals self dot bn1 batch data. We don't have to worry about activating because we don't care about the outputs. So we'll skip the activation batch data equals uh, self dot conv two uh, batch data. And you know, we don't even really need the um, batch normalization layers because it really it doesn't change the dimensionality of the problem. So actually now that I'm looking at it, let's try this. And if it doesn't actually Let's comment it out so that way I have to do less work. If it doesn't work, then we'll you know go back and uncomment this. But let's see. So I don't think it's going to matter. But uh, famous last words, right? Then we say batch data equals self dot conv three batch and data, and then comes after conv three. Uh, no, sorry, con. Yeah, after con three, we have our max pooling. So batch data equals self dot. Uh, what is it called? Max pool one. We definitely need this because it will uh, reduce the dimensionality of the problem. And then we say feed through to the next layer. Con four. 
<laughs> uh, batch data equals con5. Good grief. And then con6, if I'm not mistaken. And finally, batch data equals max pool 2. Data. And then. Um, now what we want to do is something pretty cool. We want to say we want to return int numpy product batch data dot size. So this will get us the uh, number of elements in a batch size of one. So that's how we're going to find out the input dimensions. Pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we're going to do something kind of repetitive after this. Uh, so just so you know where we are, we calculate the input dims and that goes into the first, first fully connected layer. Other thing we have to worry about is the forward pass. So batch data. So next thing we have to do is uh, calculating the forward pass. And so this is going to be a little bit different. So we have to say batch data equals t dot tensor. Um, Let's make that lowercase. Uh, and the reason I'm making it lowercase, if you watch the first video, is that the lowercase tensor preserves the data type of the underlying of the incoming data, whereas the capital T uh, uses some default data type. So I don't want it to do that. So I'm going to tell it lowercase. And you have to, uh, this is kind of a bit of a peculiarity of PyTorch. Uh, it is very. I guess strongly typed in a sense, not literally strongly typed, but it is very particular about the data types you pass it. So if you try to pass it a regular float tensor and it's expecting a CUDA tensor, it's going to give an error or vice versa. It tells you, hey, I'm expecting something else. Why are you giving me the wrong thing? And uh, since we want to do all the calculations on the GPU, it's best to start out by passing the batch data from the MNIST data set to the GPU, making it a CUDA tensor. Next, we want to perform our feed forwards. So I am going to copy all of that so we can just kind of fill in the uh, missing parts. Uh, so then we want to do a batch norm and batch 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 data equals f dot ReLU batch data. Uh, there is somewhat of a debate. This is another interesting point. There is a debate of whether or not to do batch norm before or after the ReLU activation. Um, I really don't care. Uh, we get good results with this, but uh, for more advanced, more complex problems that may actually matter, just keep that in the back of your mind that you are doing a batch norm before a ReLU activation. And ReLU is a non-commutative operation, so um, it it. Yeah, with, with respect to like things like addition and multiplication. So uh, definitely keep that in the back of your mind if you want to come back to it later to revisit the performance on the accuracy of the deep neural network. So then we have uh, conf2, batch2, batch data, self, uh, sorry, f.relu, batch data. And we have conf3. And then let's do this. Just copy, paste, and make sure to change that to BN3. And then we have the max pool, and then a conf4, a BN4, and the ReLU, and then uh, conf5, BN5, and ReLU. Whoops, that's unhappy. Um, conf6. So BN6 and then ReLU and then a max pool, of course. And then we want to say <clears throat> batch data. We want to kind of flatten it. Batch data. I'm going to be doing that all night. Batch data dot view. Batch data dot size. Zeroth element minus one. So this will flatten it into uh, the zeroth element by negative one. So it will get us. Uh, square array. No, sorry, it won't be square. It'll just be two dimensional. Sorry. And then we want to say classes equals self dot fc one batch data. Now we don't want to do any activation here on this. 
We just want to do a linear forward pass. And the reason is that the cross entropy loss will perform a soft max activation on the classes. And so you don't want to do a double soft max, you know, that's going to give you meaningless results. So we don't activate that here. The NN dot cross entropy loss is going to take care of that. And when we calculate the accuracy on our own, we're going to perform an activation using a softmax function. If you're not familiar, softmax is an, uh, an exponential function. It's like e to the something divided by the sum of the e to the somethings. So it tells you the exponentially weighted probabilities uh, such that they sum up to one. So that's a very important property for probabilities in this universe at least. All probabilities sum to one. And so whatever function you choose to calculate the uh, probability of an observation belonging to a class must, you know, sum up to one. It has to belong to one of the classes, at least. So that is that for the um, forward and get input size functions. So next we have a function to get the data. So what all this does is very simple is it says MNIST train data equals MNIST and that comes from our imports and you want to do, uh, do a make dir mnist before you run this just to be sure. Uh, say train equals true. So this is how it knows this is going to be training data. Download equals true. So if you don't have the data, it's going to go ahead and download it. Transform equals to tensor. So that'll take the data and transform it into a PyTorch tensor. And then we need to create a data loader. So we have the data. Now we have to create a object to load it self dot train data loader t dot utils dot data sorry uh, data dot data loader mnist train data match size equals self dot batch size uh, shuffle equals true you always want to shuffle your data in deep learning uh, the reason is that the uh, if the data is not pre-shuffled, then what you're doing is you're passing in data from sequential classes. Uh, it doesn't really so much matter they're sequential, but the fact that you have a large portion of the data that all belongs to the same class, followed by another chunk of data that all belongs to the same class. So what you're doing there, if you think about what we're doing in deep learning, we're kind of navigating some complex parameter space, right? We have a deep neural network that uh, transforms images into features, into mathematical linear features. So it's just some function that says, you know, this image is this feature times this uh, input parameter plus this parameter times that feature uh, and sums them all up and gives you an answer for what the probability of it belonging to a class is. So it's a highly multidimensional complex function. And if you pass in a bunch of representatives from one class, all in a row, you're going to get stuck in one little corner of parameter space. It's going to result in overtraining where it's going to, you know, not be able to generalize well. And then when you transform, when you uh, roll over to the next class, it's going to be, it's going to be a total mess because then you're shifting to a totally different portion of parameter space with weights that are tuned for a wholly separate portion of parameter space. So shuffling is incredibly important. Uh, just a long-winded way of saying make sure to shuffle your dang data. Next, we want to say num workers equals eight. That's the number of threads to dedicate to um, to this uh, data loader utility. Um, you can set that to anything less than the number of threads that you have on your PC. I don't actually know what it would happen if you set it to be more than the number of threads you have. It's probably limited by however many you actually have. So I haven't tested that. Maybe I'll play with that on the fly. So next, we want the testing data. And that's almost the same thing, except train equals false. Uh, pretty straightforward. And of course, you have to change that from train data to test data and change the name of this test data loader, train data loader, MNIST test data. Perfect. Uh, we don't need to return anything uh, because it's a pretty self-contained function. Uh, next, we want to uh, define the train function. And we don't want to call it uh, just train. And the reason is that uh, PyTorch, uh, the nn.module class already has a function called train. And uh, now don't get confused. This is a confusing point for beginners. This kind of tripped me up the first few times. Uh, this function train doesn't actually do anything with respect to training or updating the weights of the neural network. What it does is it tells PyTorch that you are about to enter the training mode. There's a training mode and a testing mode. And the reason it matters 
uh, under general case, it doesn't matter. But in the case of using batch normalization, it does matter. And the reason is that in training mode, PyTorch keeps track of the batch normalization statistics. But then when you're doing testing, it doesn't keep track of the statistics, you know, the, the norm, the standard deviation, the stuff like that from the batch norm layers. So you want to be very careful to be verbose telling PyTorch, hey, I am training my neural network, and then later on, hey, I am testing my deep neural network. So that way it doesn't update the statistics for the batch norm layers. Uh, and there's, I believe, one other function that has that same caveat. I don't recall what it is off the top of my head, but uh, I digress. So we have to say uh, we're going to iterate over our number of epochs. If you're not familiar with it, an epoch is just an iteration over the full data set. So we have a data set of order tens of thousands of samples. I forget the exact number. I think it's 50,000 or it's 60,000 in the training set and 10,000 in the test set. And so an epoch is uh, one full pass over the data set. So we're not passing in the whole data set at once. We're passing in chunks of size, batch size. And so you want to uh, iterate over that data set many, many times. In this case, we'll just default to 25. We get really good results with that. Uh, but you need an outer loop to account for that. And we want to keep uh, track of an epoch loss as well as an epoch accuracy. And those will be stored. Uh, we'll get default values of zero and an empty list respectively. Next, we want to enumerate over our data. So it has this particular form. It's going to pass back, you know, the index as well as a tuple of input and label. Train data loader. That's just how the PyTorch data loaders work. So for anything that you're using a data loader for, excuse me, this will be the default format. Very important in PyTorch uh, optimizer, not sir. This isn't uh, this isn't England, but very important is you want to zero the gradient. And the reason is that the gradients accumulate from training step to training step, and this can cause degraded performance and doesn't give you any additional useful information. So you always want to zero the gradient at the top of each training step. Next, we have to do a little bit of bookkeeping and say label to self.device. So this will take the label from the data set and send it to the device. And we want to say prediction equals self.forward input. So this will do the feed forward pass of that input that has been, uh, and the input doesn't have to be explicitly cast to the device here because that gets taken care of up here. So perform a feed forward pass to get your prediction for the batch of data. Calculate your loss, prediction, <laughs> prediction and label. And um, so this will uh, actually calculate the loss for the deep neural network. Uh, but the next thing we want to know is for our purposes, so we can kind of observe the performance of the network over time, is uh, what is the actual prediction of the class. So we want to perform a softmax activation on the output of the deep neural network along the first dimension, because the zeroth dimension is the batch. Uh, and then say classes equals t to argmax prediction dim equals one. Then we want to know how many we have wrong. So we want to count up the number of times where the classes are not equal to the labels. So wrong equals t dot where classes not equal to label. And this has the syntax of where this is true. It gets t dot tensor one. So at a value of one and uh, two, sorry, two, self dot device. Now this to self device may very well be unnecessary. Um, I'm trying to think I haven't experimented with not doing it. Uh, that I will leave as an exercise to the viewer. And then uh, the rest of the syntax is what value does it get when they are equal or when it is false in this case. So that gets a value of zero because we don't want to sum up anything for the case where we got it right. You see accuracy is one minus t dot sum wrong divided by self dot batch size. So this will scale the accuracy uh, by the batch size. Next, you want to uh, append the accuracy of this particular episode. And since, since it is a tensor, we want to dereference it with dot item that gives you the value 
uh, stored in that tensor. Otherwise, you're storing a tensor object and it's hard to operate on those. Hack history dot append act dot item. So we're keeping track of it in two different places. Episode loss plus equals loss dot item. Same deal. Loss is a tensor. We want to get the value of that tensor. So we call dot item. Next, very important, you want to back propagate the loss. If you don't do this, you don't get learning. And also, you have to step the optimizer. So if, if you don't do these two steps, then you don't get learning. So if you're a novice of PyTorch and you're running a, a training loop and you don't see your accuracy going up or your loss going down, that is the first thing to check to make sure you said loss.backward and optimizer.step. So check that first. That'll save you a lot of time of uh, bug hunting in your network. Uh, I've made that mistake before, don't feel bad. So save yourself the pain and the time and check that first. At the end of each epoch, we wanna say uh, finish epoch I total loss. We'll say 3F episode loss and accuracy. 3F, you want to make sure that you're not, you know, automatically running, uh, rounding up to one. NumPy.mean episode accuracy. So that'll just take the um, the mean of the accuracy for each batch in the epoch. Uh, and then at the end of the epoch, you want to say loss history dot append episode loss. Okay. Uh, so that is the whole of the training function. We'll come, we'll run this and come back to the, actually, uh, you know what, let's, I didn't actually do this in my cheat sheet. Let's define the, te uh, the test function. I'll do it on the fly. This almost never happens. I almost always solve stuff first and then, you know, go off a cheat sheet. Uh, but the, you know, it should actually be almost the same. So let's do this. Let's copy this. One difference is, as I said, we had to tell self.test. Uh, other thing that is going to be different is we don't care about zeroing the gradient because we're not going to be updating gradients. So we can calculate the loss. Uh, that is fine. Do I really want to do that? Yeah, I want to. I want to see the total loss over the course of the episode. So yes, I do want to do that. I want to do this. What I don't want to do is this and that. Uh, so we also need to change some variable names here. Um, we don't want ah, self dot accurate. Yeah, so let's do this. Um, you know, I'm not going to plot it. So <laughs> this is the danger of doing things on the fly. So I'm not going to plot the testing data. We're just going to uh, go ahead and print it out to the terminal to see how well it does. Okay, so uh, that should do that. Now, oh, oh, the other thing is <laughs> we have to change that to test data loader. Okay. Anything else I have to do? Um, hmm. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, we don't really want to iterate over epochs because we're not training. So I can get rid of this outer loop and move that all in and yeah so it will just do one epoch one pass through the training the test data okay so that's what i'll do okay so now that i've done this on the fly that's a rare treat for you guys i almost never do that uh, so now we get down to the business of our main loop so if name is main then you want to say network equals cnn uh, learning rate of 0 0.01. We'll give it a batch size of, I don't know, 128. It doesn't really matter. The If you're using a modern GPU, then the uh, batch size isn't a huge concern because the images are so small. They're 28 by 28. We'll do 25 training epochs. We want to call the training function. And we want to plot history and uh, plot.show plt.plot network dot accuracy history plt.show all right perfect so now we're gonna head to the terminal and see how many typos i made all right so let's see how well this worked python 
simple CNN MNIST. Moment of truth. Hasn't complained yet. Aha. Uh -huh. So it gives me a warning. I'm not going to worry about that right now. So you can see that uh, it is, in fact, learning. And it starts out with an accuracy of 96.7. And already by the fourth epoch, it is up in the 99.5 plus range. So it is learning quite well, quite effectively for a relatively straightforward convolutional neural network. Uh, I'm going to let this run. And you can check out the plots here where the loss, you know, decays exponentially over time. And the accuracy goes up to, you know, a factor of a practically one. So it arbitrarily approaches one, uh, never quite gets there, maybe in some episodes, but you know, you're never going to have truly 99, 100% uh, accuracy. Uh, one other thing of note is that uh, there is a huge difference between 99.9 .9 and 99.9999999 accuracy. Just, you know, think about it in terms of samples per million, how many mistakes you're going to make. So uh, if you're designing neural networks for industrial purposes, make sure to get as uh, good of a testing accuracy as you possibly can. And your employers and your customers, more importantly, will thank you for it. So this is about to finish. When it finishes off, we're going to see how well it does on the testing data. Uh, maybe I made a mistake in the testing loop. We'll see that in a second. So of course, after running it, I realized that I didn't actually call the testing function. So let's go ahead and uh, fix that mistake, shall we? Simple CNN MNIST, go down to the bottom and say network.test. So I want to run that again. I won't make you sit through it in one second. And after finally completing, you can see that the accuracy on the test data is actually 988. So 98.8 .8 as opposed to 99.9. .9. So we have a little degree of overtraining here. So that's something you would fix by uh, adding in some dropout to the deep neural network, uh, the convolutional neural network, uh, as well as perhaps some other hyperparameter tuning. Um, that's probably a topic for another video. Uh, however, in the next video in the sequence, we are going to get into uh, modularizing this convolutional neural network so that we can make it you know, infinitely expandable by sticking things in nicely compartmentalized modules that we can just stack together like Legos to make arbitrarily large deep convolutional neural networks. Stay tuned for that. Subscribe for that and other content. Leave a comment. Share this if you found it helpful. And hey, don't forget to hit that bell icon because I know only 14% of you get my notifications. And I'll see you all in the next video.